everyone. Uh, so as you may have guessed, I'm Andrew Chow. Uh, I'm an engineer at Blockstream, and I also work on Bitcoin Core a lot, uh, mostly in the wallet. So I'm going to be talking about hardware wallets uh, and a bit of uh, history in, with them in Core, and also how to integrate them in Core and how we are integrating them into Core. So first thing is, what do we need in order to support hardware wallets in really any software? Uh, you, there's the hardware wallet side, you need to be able to communicate with it, you have to have like the USB stuff, and then um, on top of the USB you have to have all their application level messages. So like you have the USB layer that just that's the transport and then on top everyone has a, their own special bullshit for uh, sending data to the device. Uh, but that's just the hardware side. We There's also the software side. So. Um, the wallet needs to be able to support a few things, like BIP32 public derivation. Uh, because the way we have hardware wallets work now is you get an expo from the device, and then the software wallet will watch that expo and get all the transactions and stuff. And uh, it also needs to know that there is a hardware wallet and that it should talk to the hardware wallet. Which, I guess everyone seems to also forget that that's a thing you have to do. So, let's start with the um, hardware, uh, the device side of things, uh, with wire protocols. So everyone has, as I mentioned, they have the, the USB communication layer and then the application layer on top of it. So everyone uses, um, or at some point used, this thing called HID, which is Human Interface Device, uh, except Trezor and KeepKey now use a thing called WebUSB, and so some of their firmware uses HID, but some use web USB, and they're two di completely different things, and you have to remember to support both of them if you want to support new treasures. Uh, but the other thing is the application level. So this is the messages that we're sending to the device. So Trezor, KeepKey, and all their clones use some protobuf thing that Trezor defined uh, ages ago. And Basically, you take all your messages that you want, you pack them into a specific protocol format that they <coughs> define, and you send it over to the device. But uh, if you wanted to support the ledger, the ledger does something completely different. They use something called application protocol data units, which are which is not very specific and it's completely unhelpful to know that name. Um, these uh, APDUs are actually from Java smart cards. If anyone's familiar with that. Uh, and these are completely different from protobuf. They have their own special magic numbers, their own special magic serialization, and wax and once it's in. <laughs> Points above you mean like as in Google protobuf? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, protobuf is Google protocol buffers. You can go look that up. Uh, so Ledger does something different. Then Bitbox, they do something different. They actually just send straight JSON strings. You ASCII, use ASCII to make a JSON string, and you send it to the device. Um, except that's just the bit, Bitbox 1. Bitbox 2, uh, I don't have this listed here because I'm not terribly familiar with it. The last time I looked, they also use protobuf, but it's a different protobuf from Trezor. So you can't even share code there. All you can share is that protobuf library. Uh, the last one I'm familiar with is the cold card. Cold card has defined their own binary protocol that uses some mix of ASCII and sending binary data. And they also use PSPT, which is okay. That's great, but everything else is some weird self-defined thing. And at the end of the day, this all means that when you're implementing hardware wallet support, if you want to support every different wallet, you have to have special code for every single wallet that does, every, that each wallet does the same thing but in a slightly different way. And they're all incompatible with each other, except the treasure bonds. Um, and this brings up a question that we got in Bitcoin Core was, do we want to have this vendor-specific stuff in core? Do we want to have device-specific stuff in core? And the answer to that is no. We definitely do not. Um, first of all, <coughs> who's going to maintain it? Who's going to write it? And who's going to review it? Well, uh, if I implemented it, that'd be me. But what if I stop contributing core? Then who's going to maintain it then? Or and also, who's going to review it? Like, I wrote. If I wrote the code. I at least have to have maybe two or three other people review it, and so they need to also understand everything, which is unlikely to happen. And then for future changes, they also need to review it, and it's just a huge pain in the ass. It has a lot of complexity. Uh, and also, 
an obvious answer would be to use vendor provided libraries, but uh, there aren't any in C++. So that's, I guess, out of the question now, at least in core, because core is C++. Um, uh, there's, there's lots of com complexity with every individual device. Um, and also each one in the, introduces more dependencies. Like just having HID and WebUSB, we'd have to have LibUSB, which does the USB driver stuff that at least someone else did the low level thing. But LibUSB is itself fairly large. Uh, and because this would be part of the default core installation, um, you will run into an issue where if LibUSB has a vulnerability that's exploitable, then anyone who's using core can be exploited even if they're not using a hardware wallet. And I mean, like, the number of hardware wallet users is still not, like, it's not that large. So there would be a lot of users that would be affected, affected if, even if they were just running core and using the core wallet. <coughs> uh, yeah, I forward. So what's our solution to this? Well, the solution is that, first of all, we need to define some way to send data to the device, uh, mostly transaction data, because the transactions were the most annoying part where everyone had done something different for every transaction. So we need some common transaction format that we can send to each device. Then we need to have something external to Core that the Core can talk to in order to send data to the device. So this external thing would contain libUSB and all the device specific drivers and whatever. Uh, at least it can be a different language so we could use a language that vendors have provided their libraries for. And also it would just be active only when Core needs to use a hardware wallet, so it's not always running. And last thing is that we need to make some common API so that Core can just do one thing and only know that one thing and not have to figure out everything for every device. The figuring out everything for every device can be in that separate driver. And if you're familiar with my work, you probably see where this is going. The common transaction format is PSBT. Uh, PSBT was designed with hardware wallets in mind, even though they don't fit on hardware wallets in memory, I guess, because that was not a design consideration. But at least everything that PSBT does uh, was, was created with hardware wallets in mind. That separate driver is HWI, the hardware wallet interface, so that does all the device specific things and, all the, uh, and does converting from the common API that it defines into the device specific drivers. <clears throat> so now if you're going to ask me uh, who's going to maintain the device specific drivers in the HWI, the answer is not me, it's actually the vendors because I'm using their libraries. HWI is written in Python and every vendor has provided a Python library, thank God. Because uh, I would not have done that if I had to write it all myself. So switching a little bit, let's talk about the software. Also, any questions on that? Yeah. Is there any like, uh, you know, I guess after the fact, you realize that PSPTs don't fit in these hardware device mem like, uh, yeah, when in their memory. Yeah, when Jonas Shelley told me, yeah. Well, so uh, is there any, I guess, thoughts that are kind of rumbling around in the background of making them smaller? Uh, at this point, no. But I think most of the benefit for making them smaller would be to just tell everyone to stop using legacy transactions. The non segue inputs is problem, right? Yeah, non segue inputs can be very large. If everyone just use Segway, then it's almost not a problem anymore. Uh, so, what is the expectation that future hardware wallets will just have more memory? Sorry? Is this, so future hardware wallets will just have more memory? Yeah, if they, uh, future hardware wallets, hopefully, now that PSBT is public and people know about it, yeah. that they will consider that and then include more memory. So like the cold card uh, takes PSBTs directly and I guess part of their design process was they knew about PSPT and figured out how much memory they would need in order to store a PSPT. So let's talk about the software. Uh, in the Bitcoin Core wallet itself, um, which is, uh, is actually not well suited to hardware wallets. Um, first, let's talk about how the wallet itself is structured. So a wallet has a few major components. We have key management. Uh, and Bitcoin Core does this as a bag of keys. It just has a bunch of keys and everything is based on those keys. We take a key, turn it into an address, turn it into a script hub keys, turn it into sign things with it. Everything is based on keys. The, 
Core wallet, also the signing. Um, this is actually related to key management and maybe should have been one bullet point. Uh, <coughs> the wallet also does tra uh, transaction tracking. Uh, you know, it looks for the script pub keys from the, app, from the keys that it has and it checks to see if any transactions are related to those uh, script pub keys. It also has a bunch of metadata stuff like address labels. So the part we're concerned about is key management and signing. Now, for a bit of history, uh, we need to get Bit32 into core before we can start doing hardware wallets. So, you know how long it took Bit32 to get into core? Frickin' forever. Bit32 was published in 2012. Uh, and the reference implementation, which was just key derivation, was actually merged into Bitcoin core, but it wasn't used anywhere. Not in the wallet, not in the node. It was literally just part of the test binary and as a reference for people to look at. So in 2015, which is, by the way, three years after Bit32, uh, and a ton of wallets had already done Bit32 by this point, we got our first attempt for Bit32 into core. And this first attempt actually was pretty big. It did things like um, user-defined derivation paths. Uh, you could rotate out the map, the HDC, so you could do key rotation. And um, it also did key derivation on the fly. So we, it wasn't storing any private keys to derive. It would derive them as needed. It would just store public keys, I think. Uh, but also, it only did private key derivation. So if we had this, it still wouldn't have been enough for hardware wallets. But unfortunately, reviewers didn't like it. And six months later, we got the second attempt, which dropped a few things from the first one. Uh, it didn't do on the fly derivation. It was just, it was still using the key pool. It would derive a key, drop it into a key pool. Uh, you still, I don't think that one did um, user-defined derivation paths either. Uh, so, so that one didn't, uh, you, it, would, it wouldn't derive on the fly and you could not change the derivation path. Uh, it still did the key rotation stuff, but this one also didn't make it. The third attempt was in May of 2016, six months later. And this was the absolute bare minimum for Bit32, which means it's also enormously unuseful for hardware wallets and enormously unuseful for literally anything else but getting a backup. Uh, all it did was replace the generate new key function from generate a key randomly to derive it from this HDC. Uh, that's all it did. Absolute minimum, nothing else was changed in the wallet, and that's what finally got merged, and you know what, that's what we still use today. Uh, there have been a few changes since then, like we can now do key rotation. Uh, that was merged, uh, I think, like a year ago or something. You can change the HDC using set HDC, but you still can't change the key paths, and you can't do public derivation. Uh, so there was an attempt to get that public derivation, uh, which was in 2017. And actually, based on this public derivation PR, uh, someone did a full treasure implementation, and someone else did a full ledger implementation using the whole drop vendor-specific code uh, into core. Those were never PR because I think they knew it would get, get nowhere. Um, but like, they existed and people did use them, or at least the author did. Uh, but that watching external XPubs thing got killed after a year, unfortunately. And so what we're left with is a core wallet that still has that bare minimum Bit32 derivation, still can't do the public derivation, and still can't let you use your own derivation paths, which kind of sucks if you want to do hardware wallets, because we need those features in order to have hardware wallets. Also, the uh, hardware wallet project kind of started in 2018. Or at least that's when everyone else jumped on board. Um, I've been working on this since 2017, but that was mostly just PSPT. So in order to make hardware wallets work, we finally decided that instead of just jamming it into the core wallet and trying to hack, hack things together, that we're actually just going to fix the wallet and make it possible for us to do new things in the future. Um, so. This is a huge refactor of the wallet, basically, and it's taken the better part of a year to finally get merged. But it's at least a step closer to hardware wallets. 
So the particular thing that we did was make this thing called a script pub key manager. Um, and basically what we did was take all the key management stuff, uh, like the bag of keys thing, and really the key to script pub key part, uh, and just kind of shove it in its own box. So it can be in a separate place from the wallet. So it's just a layer of encapsulation and abstraction. Uh, basically, the wallet will ask the script pub key manager for script pub keys, which means addresses in this case, uh, and use those script pub keys to give to the user or to watch for transactions. But how the script pub keys came to be, how they were generated, whatever, that's all abstracted away into the script pub key manager. The wallet doesn't care about it. And when the wallet needs to sign something, sign a transaction, it takes, passes the transaction to the script pub key manager, and it does whatever special magic it needs to sign it. Or at least it should, but I didn't implement it that way. Uh, <laughs> and I will probably fix that. Uh, yeah, I realized like a couple days ago that I had not done that, so I need to fix it again. And the thing about this model is that we can make different script pub key managers that do different things internally. So obviously we have the thing that we do now, bag of, the bag of keys, which we just kind of throw into a thing that we call the legacy script pub key manager because it's legacy code and it's a legacy that we don't want to have anymore. So, so it's still a, a bag of keys model even though you switched to BIP32 for deriving addresses as of, what is it, May 2016 you said? Yeah, it was point thirteen. So actually, I'll say what was released. So from point thirteen, it, w it was already generating keys. Yes. So, but it was still the bag of keys model. All it did was, you know, instead of calling the random number generator, it called derive a key from a seed. It, everything else about how keys were managed was exactly the same. What about the storing from seed? How does that work in you that can't. model? You can't. Oh, so <laughs> what's the point? Uh, <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> the point was that um, if you backed up your wallet like that, you didn't have to do it every hundred keys. Oh right. Okay. So you yeah. could back it up once. Oh, and yeah, I forgot how terrible it used to be. That was awful. <laughs> so so you you could back it up once and then not have to make periodic backups. And you would still have all your keys and not lose everything. But I mean, like Greg Maxwell still says, like you should back up periodically so you get all your transaction metadata because that's still fairly important, especially if you want to preserve privacy. I've got a question. Yeah. Um, why couple the script pub key management and the private key management? Because the private keys and the script pub keys are inherently related. The private key material is much more sensitive than the script. Right, but material. but you so this also lets us do different ways to produce script pub keys. Um, so the idea is that the way that it currently works, or it worked two weeks ago, was that we take a key and we turn it into something. Rather, but the idea that we're trying to move towards is, here is a script, what do we need to sign for it? Instead of like, here's the thing we need to, here's what we need to sign for, uh, what do we need, what can that sign for? So we're trying, kind of reversing that idea. So that's why we have script pub key management with the private keys. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> and really what this means is that we can hide away where the private keys are. So the one other thing that we're working towards with this script pub key manager is to use descriptors. Uh, we're making a descriptor wallet, uh, and the way that we're doing that is we have this descriptor script pub key manager. Uh, this model lets us have descriptors be the thing that produces our script pub keys, but nothing else needs to know that. Nothing else cares that that's how it works, it just needs to work. Uh, and in that model, the private keys are actually less important. Uh, I mean, you need them for signing, but like that can just be the signing part of things, not the script pub key management thing. Is a descriptor like a function from pub keys to a script pub key or something like that? Uh, like so the descriptors, well, are you going to do advancing tomorrow? Yeah. Yeah, well, I'll be talking about it. Then. Okay, cool. Like, Never mind. I have a whole talk on descriptor wallets well, tomorrow at advancing. Cool. Um, yeah, basically, the descriptor is a function, takes arguments, and spits out a script. Not necessarily public key. Um, yeah. Uh, so also, so last thing is, uh, if you want to like actually read about this, we have a document on the Bitcoin Core Developer Way, <coughs> which not many people know exists. Um, you can go look at that. It's really in the weeds. So there will be a lot of things that don't make sense to you, probably. <laughs> you can take a picture of that.
doesn't even have a deck with heal resist. Yeah, it's a thing there. Uh, no one checks it, and I checked it a few months ago, and someone vandalized it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, oh, wait, what, so yeah. sorry, like, is, is that like Bitcoin or? Uh, it's just Bitcoin Core. Uh, this is basically where we stage release notes. Oh, okay. Um, so when we're doing a release, we start. Uh, so we have like re the release notes in the master repo, but then when we start a release process, we put them on the developer wiki so the developers can go edit them and add things that need to be added. How did someone vandalize it? Because this document was there, that was an actual document, and they vandalized it. I don't know why. I just reversed it. Someone needs merge rights to do that. Though. Not on the wiki. Not, wikis. Uh, Not on wiki. Wikis are completely insecure like that. <laughs> uh, at least. Not in, not the way that GitHub has done this wiki, for some reason. Like they could limit it. It would be nice if they limited just to uh, organization members. But yeah. So this script pokey manager thing uh, is how we're doing hardware vaults because we're just going to make a hardware script pokey manager, and we've taken all the key management stuff like signing and abstracted it away. So the hardware script pokey manager can ask via HWI, ask a hardware wallet for pub keys, or in this case, it'll actually be descriptors. Uh, HWI will take the pub keys and produce a descriptor for core. The descriptor is what we're using to generate our script pub keys. And then when we sign, transaction goes to the hardware script pub key manager, which just hands it off to HWI for signing. And so this is actually how we're going to do hardware wallets in core, and it's so much easier than hacking it into whatever exists right now. Uh, for the current status of all this stuff, we've got some. We have got an issue one four one four five that tracks everything, um, or should track everything. I don't know if it's been updated recently, but that has like uh, a bit of <coughs> the motivation and some other relevant details that people might care about for hardware wallet support. Um, this refactor was merged finally last week after I've written the slides. So, but yeah, we actually do now have the script pub key manager model now, and so we are finally moving forward with descriptor wallets. Uh, our descriptor wallets is in the works. There's a PR for it, it's experimental, you can try it out, you might lose your money, not my fault. <laughs> um, but descriptor wallets is a step towards our hardware wallet stuff because we're going to be, uh, because we use the descriptors for script pub key production, we're just going to subclass the descriptor script puppy manager and then replace the signing part with HWI, basically. And uh, there is actually a PR that lets you use hardware wallets in core. Shores has written one. Um, I actually don't know how he's implemented it, but I think the design will probably change uh, just because his thing was just screwing around mostly. Um, but yeah, there's a PR that implements everything. Uh, want to try it. Um, as for HWI itself, HWI is feature complete and completely usable. It can talk to the five devices I mentioned, Trezor, KeepKey, Ledger, Nano, S and X, uh, Cold Card, and Bitbox One. Wait, that's six devices. Okay. Um, so uh, you can use HWI as a standalone thing. And actually, Wasabi and BTC Pay Server are both using uh, HWI, which is kind of scary, but they found many bugs, which is also kind of scary. <laughs> um, so yeah, thanks them for testing my software. Uh, and hardware wallets, you can use it with core <coughs> HWI manually. There's a there's a command line thing, and if you're not a, if you're not scared of the terminal, you can do it, but it's also very scary for everyone else. But actually, and this is what I'm going to be demoing, uh, there's been a lot of changes to that, um, to Core and to HWI recently, or upcoming changes to HWI, that will let you uh, do everything from a GUI. So for all the new users, or slightly more advanced users, but don't like the terminal, uh, there's a, there will be a GUI that you can use for everything. Yeah? How does it work the integration between HWI and was that video <laughs> They told me that they are using it. I it's based on MB Square, isn't it? The C-Shop library. Yeah, I think so. So C-Shop talks with the Python stuff? So, 
HWR is Python, but it's a command line tool. Uh, in every programming language I know, you can execute an external program mm -hmm. and get its standard in or standard out results and send things over standard in. So uh, basically, the way that HWI is used in those software and will be used in core is that we ex execute it as an external command, uh, pass in whatever arguments, and then when it completes its thing, it returns a result in JSON. And that's how we get our stuff. So that's how they integrate it, just using whatever C sharp things that they need to do. Anything else? No. Then we use uh, like um, just what the console out or the yeah. yeah something. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure. Like uh, you could use if you're Linux only, you could use fork and exec if you really wanted to. <laughs> um, but in core, actually, we're going to use boost process probably. Yeah, so I'm sorry, it's, it's, it's a bit of a complex question, but so why, why, why did you choose Python? Because uh, it, it looks like... It's very simple. Like it's very simple. Uh, everyone has provided a Python library. <laughs> <laughs> so that means less work for me. Because it's not really practical, like, I mean... It's not practical, but everyone has a Python library, which means that I don't have to implement all the low-level bullshit. Uh, the vendors have done it, and also they're presumably experts in their own device. Which means that they're unlikely to make a huge mistake like I would. Less likely. Less likely. <laughs> I mean, I'm, they definitely have, but like, at least it's not my fault. Yeah, and Python doesn't seem the safest language to implement this kind of stuff. Well, there's nothing private that's being. No, no, not only for that, but in terms of, you know, I don't know there's no like compilation. Or... What, what I mean is like, there's nothing that. Uh, the Python doesn't handle anything that needs to be kept confidential or secure. Could people not like mutate descriptors so that your wallet ends up sending money to someone else? Uh, you can, but also you should be verifying addresses on the device. So we have. <laughs> um, it's kind of a user problem. <laughs> uh, so like you get an address from Core, but there's a command in HWI that's display address and. If your device has a screen, it'll show the address. Mm -hmm. You should check, double check, right? I mean, you should do that with hard wallets anyways. You should. Mm -hmm. Bitbox One doesn't have a screen. Yeah, Bitbox One doesn't have a screen. And I haven't figured out. Someone mentioned something about a mobile app that with the Bitbox One that you could do something. But uh, we have not done anything with this. Um, also, Bitbox One is uh, officially not supported by Shift Crypto anymore. Which means that at some point it will be officially not supported by HWI once I decide to get rid of it, like the Treasure One. Alright. Um, let me start testing it first. I cannot obtain a lot from the data directory. No. Is it already running? I guess it's already running. So, Trezor made a great decision with the, with Trezor T, and that's they use the same protocol for Trezor One and Trezor T, uh, which means that supporting Trezor T was only a matter of making sure everything still worked, uh, and everything did still work. So, there's a, so Trezor T has this weird bug where it can't sign. At least last time I tried, it could not sign mixed segwit and non segwit transactions, which do you mean is weird? Best, or what do you mean by mixed? Like an input's legacy and an input is segment. Okay. There was an issue where, it, and I think there is still an issue where it can't do that. Um, but the treasure one can. Which is obvious. Yeah. What happens in that case? Can you just like? It throws uh, it throws some bizarre error that makes no sense. Would you would you be able to just like try um, make a new transaction and choose to? <coughs> yeah. Or would it would just the, do the core just keep? Keep selecting the same inputs again and again. Uh, so the core selection is actually semi-deterministic. So it probably would try selecting the same inputs. But you also have the option of, so if you're using purely the GUI, 
Um, you cannot create a legacy address in core. It's literally impossible because that's been disabled in the GUI. If you're using, uh, if you're using from the command line, you can create a legacy address, um, and there would only be a problem then. Uh, or if you had old addresses from before. You could use yeah, before. you could use an older one. So initializing a new device with initializing an already used device is a bit with core is a bit weird. We have a rescan bug uh, that has been near impossible to nail down. So you actually might not be able to find your coins if you imported an old device. At least for now. Um, Wait, rescan bug? What was this? It's for HWI, is it? Oh. No, no, in core. Yeah, uh, cool. So, randomly, um, and by the way, it was random, <laughs> I will import something into core, and I want to rescan, rescan from beginning, and it cannot find the transactions. When did this happen? 16, maybe, at least, when I first tried it. Maybe, so no, this thing is 18. It must be rare, then. <clears throat> it's, it's like, rare, no. It's not that rare, but it only happens, it might be uh, some of the changes we made to import multi specifically. Because mm -hmm. um, I don't think I've replicated this on the other import commands. This isn't related to the, the, that really slow, there's, there's like a database lock slowing it down, wasn't there, with import multi? Mm, I don't think so. No. There's just some weird thing about that. But like, so it will not work, but then when I toss it into GDB to debug the thing, it starts working. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, Sorry, that, just always run it. This is so slow. <laughs> just go GDP. Oh, yeah, just release it with GDP. Just sync me in it from GDP. Uh, okay. So that's, oops. Um, the hell's that? Okay, there we go. So, uh, Here's my test now wallet that I'm not going to sync because I'm on data, and that's going to be expensive. Uh, is this no wallet that I do? Yes. Okay. So, damn it, I gotta get my devices. Uh, so for this one, I'm going to be using a cold card just because that's the easiest thing to do. Um, can use any device. So the branches this is running on, uh, so core is running off of my uh, descriptor wallet branch, uh, which if you look at my repo, it's named Wallet of the Glorious Future. Um, uh, yeah. Uh, and there have been some GUI changes to core recently that do, uh, when you have a watch only wallet, it will produce a PSPT. Uh, you can send, and when you click send, it actually says create unsigned, and you can, it'll make a PSPT. Uh, although the, to actually like do something with the PSPT, you have to still go through the RPC console. Um, uh, Glenn is working on the, a GUI for PSPT workflow. And then HWI, uh, this is the experimental HWI GUI. Now, I'm not a GUI designer, and I don't work with QT that much, so it's um, kind of shitty, but it works. Uh, this one has, so this is the QT branch, but there's also, uh, I think there's a bug fix in here somewhere uh, from one of the other branches that <clears throat> has not been merged yet because I haven't had the time to do it. Let me enter my pin of one, two, three, four, five. So I have a ton of hardware walls, and they're all test devices, <laughs> including this one. So if everyone wants private keys to this, I mean, I can't tell you a C because I don't know it anymore. But OK, so in HWI, in this GUI, uh, it doesn't auto refresh. So, But now it picks up the cold card, and I can select it and wait a few minutes while it tries to figure out everything. Uh, while that's going, let's make a new. Uh, we can make a new watch-only wallet in core. Uh, there's a nice GUI for this. 
So because it's watch only, we need to select the disable private keys option. Um, this is how Core knows that a wallet is watch only, by the fact that it has no private keys. Uh, don't confuse this for the fact that you can import an address as watch only into a normal wallet, which is, well, I consider this to be bad design, but uh, we are deprecating it, and, but you can still do it, but please don't. <laughs> it's, it will be unsupported very soon. Uh, make a blank wallet, okay, that doesn't actually matter because disable private keys implies blank. And then uh, I added a new checkbox in this PR to, so you can make a descriptor wallet. So this is um, demo. Makes a wallet, yay. Now, HWIQT, um, there are two commands to get uh, like descriptor stuff from, H from HWI, and that's get key pool and get descriptors. In the GUI, what I've done is just have it automatically do that in the main screen uh, so that you have the info right there. Uh, the thing about so get descriptors is just useful if you want to look at some descriptors. But get key pool is formatted specifically to work with import multi and the import descriptors command that we're introducing. So that all you have to do is copy and paste the thing uh, if we're working on the command line. So you don't need to fiddle around with JSON crap. Um, so I can just copy this and then open up the uh, debug console. We don't have a GUI for importing either, um, but I'll probably add that soon. Uh, but the command for this is import descriptors, paste the thing copied from the HWI, wait a few seconds, yay. Uh, and actually now that means that I can fetch a bunch of addresses from core. So like I just get a new receiving address. Damn it, what did I do wrong? Oh, this is a P2SH. Yeah. Hold on, I, I forgot. Um, when I set this up, I used batch32 <laughs> and not nested, but the default is always nested. So I'm gonna have to import this again. But yeah, I can like make new addresses for, uh, that's a bug by the way, the fact that it shows nothing. <laughs> so that will be fixed eventually. Um, but uh, if you choose to do P2SH addresses like I just did now, you can see here's the address, you can just get a bunch of them. And the thing with that is, uh, if you look at the key pool size, um, you see that it stays 1,000 even though you know I get a bunch of addresses. And, or at least it should. Oh, it's, there's an off by one. It stays consistent. Uh, <laughs> it stays consistent. If you did this with import multi, uh, it would slowly tick down until it hits zero. Because with import multi, which is the way that you would do hardware wallets now, Import multi just only imports things into the key pool once. Um, so uh, if you don't import enough keys or you use all your keys, you have to go back to your hardware wallet and fetch more. Uh, with descriptors, it's generating them from the descriptors as it goes. The other cool thing with descriptors is uh, instead of, so the, the one I just imported was SHWPKH. Uh, if I really wanted to, I could make that a multisig. Uh, and get multi-sig addresses. Alright. So this is batch 32 now. Uh, so let me import the batch 32 more. Import descriptors. So now I can get a batch 32 address. Yay. Um, and then... Uh, so I sent a transaction to this. From... That. That. So hopefully it rescans. The fuck? Damn it. I screwed up somewhere. Hold on. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> right, that must have been the one that was last time that was last used here. <laughs> So the main thing with this is that you you can almost do it all from the GUI, and hopefully in point 20 you will be able to. 
So there's an open PR for the PSPT side of things. So that's like, so in particular, that's the finalized PSPT command and then send raw transaction. Um, and then, uh, what was the other one? What? Is there a fire hunter over there? <laughs> no, it just takes a takeoff. Uh, it does this every time I start the core for some reason. Um, the other thing that we haven't done is the import stuff. Uh, that will need its own doing. Make a wallet again. Oh. <clears throat> At least the import is fast. Uh, import multi, the import used to take 30 or so seconds. Uh, with even larger wallets, import multi used to time out the RBC. So the RBC will wait 60 seconds and then time out. Import multi used to do that. Uh, descriptors is very quick. So that, yeah, that error or that warning is because there was a time on Bitcoin Talk where people would tell people to go to dump Priv key and then post the Priv key. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. uh, block height I was using is that one. So we scan there. It's been a few days. Okay. And hey, look, there's a transaction I made last week. Um, so this thing, uh, I can uh, sign the transaction now. So from the normal send dialog, like it says create unsigned because this is a watch only wallet. And I can send my Bitcoin back to where it came from. So if I, um, amount, 10. If you notice, there's actually there's another bug. Uh, it says zero down here. It should say ten. <laughs> um, yeah. So normally this says send, but now it says copy PSPD clipboard. Uh, so it copies it, and now I can go to HWI, click the sign PSPD button, drop in the dialog, click sign, wait a few minutes for the thing to do it. Validating. Okay to send. Yeah, sure. Why not? It's just testnet coins. Signs it and it spits out a PSPT. Uh, and then the last thing is to finalize the PSPT. I get this nice hex thing which I can do send. And it sends and it works. Yay. Um, so it's like Almost entirely in the GUI. Uh, it's, in the, it's in the GUI. The GUI. That's <laughs> 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 the GUI. Uh, well, so the thing is that the, la the only three commands I needed to do are going to get their own actual GUIs soon. Soon. So what's, that, what's, that last step, what's that step going to look like when you do it properly, though? Like, you, you create the raw PSVT so you can display to the user something like a visualization of of the transaction that they created, yeah? Yeah. Because in, in Electrum they've got it quite nicely, I don't know if you know, they've got like a, they yeah. sort of highlight, it they highlight the yeah, yeah. that yours, so they, they make everything I'm not sure what it's going to be, uh, Glenn has a Somebody else PSP. <laughs> Somebody else has done it, oh, okay. but I have not reviewed it. Oh, okay. And I may not, <laughs> I might end up not reviewing it. <laughs> Just not get around to it. Um, but I think that will have the finalized thing and the, uh, the uh, sending part too. So it will actually be entirely new. Um, for the importing stuff, uh, there's a plan to actually do it in both HWI and in core. So Greg Sanders wants HWI to, from the HWI GUI, uh, to call the core RPCs and do the create wallet and do the import for you, um, which may be useful, maybe not. I don't know. Uh, but I'm also planning on adding the import dialog to core itself. So then it will actually all be in the GUI. <laughs> Alright, so that's it. Any any questions? Cool. There's a bunch of
bunch of other things not guilty here that you can mess around with. Yeah. Uh, for, first, a comment like the import address rhythm is actually quite practical. Mm -hmm. You know, you said you, you will deprecate like importing read only addresses. Yeah. Uh, I find it practical. So. Well, <laughs> are you can... importing it into a wallet that already has private keys? You find no, that practical? No, no, like to Bitcoin Core. Like right, well, able... so, so the thing is, we want to get rid of the mixed, mm -hmm. you have private keys, but you also have a bunch of things you're watching. Yeah, that's nice. A bunch of watch only things. And that causes a huge problem in core. We're trying to get rid of that. So it'll be, you can still import stuff, but you have to make a specific watch only wallet for your imports. Yeah. yeah. I was also wondering if PSBT could also be used to do things like um, coin join on the fly when you're paying a merchant. And that merchant, say, creates a transaction. Which one of his own inputs? And yeah. he gives it to you and you add your inputs to it. Ask Waxwing, he, he uh, <laughs> partially came up with that idea. <laughs> no, we. we, we uh, okay, yes, I. Okay. I see what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, pay join, right? Sorry? Pay join is, is, the, is pay a join. Common, yeah. common name. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, PSBD can be used for that, but what? I don't think anyone has. Oh, we don't you have your like, snicker thing, right? Uh, we have we have pay join in join market, but it's just a completely like join market to join market wallet oh. thing, and it's on the command line. It's not in the, in the GUI, so it's very basic. But, but I don't. But I think you're right. I think that would be I a think, natural. Yeah, I think that's like beautiful. That's like the future of privacy. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, you could if you wanted to. PR yeah. is welcome, is what you're saying. <laughs> yes. <laughs> PR is welcome. <laughs> um, like so, pay join itself is on my list of things to do. Uh, but it's also after descriptor wallets, which is probably going to take another year. Or, I, well, not just descriptor wallets, hard wallets in general will take another maybe year or so. Yeah. Yep. I'm, I'm curious about the process you went through, like with PSBT, the beep itself. Like, so you said you got like kind of feedbacks from the hardware wallet providers, like after the fact, kind of. So. Yes. Why, why was it not involved from the beginning since it, since it was targeting them? Kind of? um, I don't know. So, uh, PSPT, I think I mailed the, the Bitcoin dev list in like fall of 2017 and no one responded to it. I, got, I think I got literally zero response, maybe one from Peter who had helped me write the thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, not the yeah, greatest response, but... Yeah, yeah. But sometimes um, maybe you need to be more direct, I mean, go to yeah, the well, directly. I mean, like, for example, with the Taproot stuff, like, you know, there's, there's, there's been a lot of stuff, like, going on, like, you know, pushing, like, trying to get this working group together. I know PSP is not that, that big of a stuff, but still. Yeah, so I probably could have contacted all the hard wallet developers, but at that time, I was also very new to the world of hard wallets and didn't know anything about that. Um, I got the feedback from Jonas Schnelli a few months after afterwards. It was like just a random comment on IRC about it too. Like, well PSPT is also a memory I'm like, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, because it, it feels kind of a shame because like it doesn't. If, if I mean I like PSBT like I've I've, I've practiced a bit with it, but but I kind of feel it's a shame because that it doesn't really solve the problem that people are still going to keep doing new stuff because there is no standard. Yeah, well, so I think it can fit in most devices, uh, and at least I've been told that the vendors have been like investigating uh, PSBT and their stuff like. Trezor has been doing some work on that. Um, but also, I think uh, there's also a problem where they didn't want to do it. No. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Some weird stuff like that. They won't uh, it's just, um, like cold, and then Cold Card came along and then actually used PSPT in their device. But it seems. Like for now, uh, we need to have this translation between PSBT and all the vendor provided things. Um, and even if they did take PSBT, they probably all still use their own, like at least application level type of message. Uh, so there still has to be translation there, anyways. Now, very in motivation for whether they support multisig, right? Like Ledger isn't particularly interested in supporting multi-sig. Depends on how you define support, actually. Okay. 
So the ledger, you can do a multi-sig with HWI. Um, now, there's a question of some security things, like is the change address correct? Um, there's also like, uh, are, is this multi-sig the multi-sig you're expecting to use? Like, just questions like that. Um, so technically, Ledger does support it, but maybe not in the way that you would want to define support. Uh, and so this is also possibly a bad idea in HWI. Uh, we technically also support multi-sig in Trezor, at least Trezor 1, uh, and sometimes Trezor T. Uh, and also technically we support CoinJoin, uh, even though they don't support CoinJoin or multi-sig in this manner. And I say that because, uh, so the way we do it is really dumb. Uh, we tell the device that it's signing for something that is, that like it's creating a signature that it thinks belongs to it, it uh, for the input it, it thinks is its. Uh, <laughs> and we just discard it if it's not actually, actually theirs. So, if it, so we tell the Trezor that this input, which is uh, some input that, it, that does not belong to the device, we tell it that it does belong to it, even though it doesn't actually, and then we throw away the signature at the end. Um, this is how we signed for, for <laughs> coin joins and stuff. Um, probably not the safest thing to do. Uh, it's also how we sign for multi-sig, because let, uh, Trezor has some requirements on multi-sigs. So for the keys that aren't the Trezors, we tell it it's, it is the Trezors, and then we throw away the signature. Um, we can do this because of SegWit. What do you mean? So it was signed it. it was so it makes a signature. It gives you a bogus signature. Yeah, it gives you a signature. Because, because we need it to give... It will not give me any signatures if it doesn't know certain parameters. And we don't always know those parameters. Usually we don't. So I just need it to give me a signature for the thing that I don't care about. And then it will give me a signature for the thing I do care about. And I can throw away everything else. That's how we do multi sig yeah, with Trezor. Right just moan and go, I don't own that. So it can't can check. Me? It's too dumb to check. Uh, <laughs> this doesn't sound dangerous at all. I don't know if there are any security issues. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so I had implemented that and I was like, wait, <laughs> we should probably like, fix it and not do that. But then Greg Sanders was like, I think it's fine. Uh, it's like, uh, I guess I'll hide it behind some expert mode switch. Uh, that I then didn't introduce for a few months. <laughs> um, the problem with the, with the multi-sigling with the Trezor T is that because we use SegWit to create the bogus signature, uh, if the entire multi-sig is not SegWit, or the entire transaction is not SegWit, it runs into that mixed SegWit and non-SegWit error, which is one of the most infuriating things I've run into. <laughs> you have a question? Yeah, yeah so... Uh Functionality or security wise, is there a clear statement of what your principles can do or cannot do? A very explicit statement about any guarantee or conditional guarantee. Like for the HWI? Or for security? Or because your, your, your interface would depend on some other things. <coughs> yeah, so. And, and also, say for the Python interface, Python itself is a huge library, including. Packages of modules like weak ref or so. So for, for the underneath Python, what requirements you lay on, on it? So as long as it complies with certain, maybe I imagine reduced sets of language features uh, up to which level, then your interface can function. Um, we don't have anything doc documents that right now, but uh, I spent quite a bit of time going through all the dependencies that we rely on and. So one of the things that was an issue was that um, the Trezor lib by itself imports a whole ton of other crap uh, for shellcoins. What? what? How, how many? De how, how many dependencies? Trezor lib had like ten dependencies by itself, or something, uh, and almost I think almost all of them I removed. Uh, so Trezor supports a lot of shellcoins. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and and so. Um, Instead of so originally we had depended on Trezor library directly. It was an explicit dependency. Uh, then what I did was I went to their source code, copied everything, copied it to, to HWI, and then deleted everything we didn't need. 
So that was all the shit coins, all the dependencies that we don't care about, like requests, uh, which for those of you who don't know is an HTTP library. Um, deleted a bunch of dependencies, deleted a bunch of code, and then removed other, who the fuck's calling me? Uh, deleted a bunch of things that were not necessary for HWRI to function. And I did this for <coughs> every device. So, uh, we reduced, so HWI only depends on like, only has explicit dependencies on maybe six libraries. And the, the dependency, and that includes the dependencies of the dependency. Yeah. So like, uh, Trezor depends on a library called Mnemonic. Um, so Mnemonic is one of the, our six dependencies. So, I, so it doesn't actually rely on that many things. And then the other thing that uh, we, uh, we do for HWI is uh, I use a tool called PyInstaller to produce a completely standalone binary for HWI that contains Python itself and any dependencies that are required. So it's self-contained. Uh, and then as for device, like weird device things like that Trezor bug, um, Every device has a has a document that says what it supports, and then all of the weird caveats about using it. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, so it's a link to Chris's presentation. Then, have you thought at all about hardware wallets in Lightning? Absolutely not. <laughs> 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 oh, they're all now. And then with Schnorr, any, uh, what, how much work is it going to be to, uh, to uh, integrate to description or something? So for Schnorr, PSPT is going to get a bunch of new fields for Schnorr. We are not reusing uh, most, uh, so like the signature field, we're not reusing that for mm. Schnorr. Um, we'll, I think we'll still reuse the bit 32 piece thing, yeah. because that's kind of that's it's universal. Translated. It's like yeah. Yeah. Um, does this mean that PSPTs will get bigger? Uh, well, probably not. Okay, right. No, I think uh, like depends on if you have like a tap script. No, it probably won't get that much bigger. Right. I mean, tap script lets you. Do you need to put like the Merkle proof on the? That's still in discussion. Okay, about whether that's going to be needed. <laughs> um, Cool, thank you, Andrew.